topic of the panel discussion is uh, education technology and state let me uh, first introduce uh, mr gurumurthy and dr g and dr amit for first of all thank you so much uh, to me was science center for having me on this panel and i am so looking forward to listening to dr sahana who i have not met and uh, equally to uh, gn who is a old friend and uh, co-conspirator if i may say so uh, i'm happy to be here with all of you and sorry once again for not being able to turn my camera on due to some hardware glitch uh, in terms of um, larger potential and challenges i would like to take one step back and say that the purpose of any technology is to make life better i mean that's a definition of technology and education technology has to be situated within that so an education technology by and large we usually talk of only computers or internet but any technology even uh, you know a very simple thing like a duster in a classroom has a very important role to play because that's only way the person teaching can keep writing again and again and that's the purpose of the duster so every technology's purpose is that it has to help and simplify and make the job of learning easier when it comes to education technology one of the challenges that we have uh, is that it seems to be able to do so many things so it seems to be able to enable content to come into the teaching learning processes much easier we can go to the net we can access materials and that we you know is an important element of teaching it also seems to enable pedagogy to be much better by allowing teachers to bring in videos and you know in the previous session we were looking at astronomy and of course you can bring astronomy into the classroom using tools like uh, stellarium so there is a lot that one can do in content and pedagogy and that is what you know dr punya mishra has conceptualized as the technological pedagogical content knowledge framework which i invite all the people in the audience if you have not heard of that framework that's a very useful framework to look at how technology can be useful in teaching learning it's called the tpck framework technological pedagogical content knowledge framework so that is if you look at the area of teaching learning per se but when you say education education is much more than teaching learning and the problem that we have as far as technology is concerned is that the sector and that's not only the tech sector the entire tech sector is very much driven by large corporations and large corporations dictate what the discourse is what we will understand as what technology can do and obviously these large corporations are only primarily concerned with their commercial interests so unfortunately a lot of the hype that we hear comes from edtech corporations desire to have more and more users more and more consumers more and more customers for that product and that can take away from the possibilities that technology can actually be used so then what can it be used for i would like to say in a broader sense technology has to help achieve the original goals of education so what are the goals of education empower learners empower teachers decentralized power structures so in india for example we have a extremely centralized bureaucratic hierarchical system can technology be used to actually empower teachers and learners can technology be used to empower disempower bureaucrats so disempowerment of bureaucrats is extremely important because that's how we can empower the uh, grassroots can it help in decentralization can it help resist the privatization of education that we see happening actually it's a contrary you no know, technology is helping privatization of education greatly but we need to resist that so i see that there are possibilities but there are even bigger challenges and dangers that we need to be aware of we need to wear an educator's hat i think too often we are enamored by technology and we forget the basic principles of education which is to empower learners and teachers if we keep that in mind then i think we will be guided in how we can go about using technology this is what i would like to say as my initial comments i'll come in later thank you amit gn has spoken a lot uh, not so much today about the way technology should be designed so that the communication is more decentralized and peer to peer and i think he has several times also shown architectures uh, of networks which will permit and encourage that kind of a uh, you know peer and and, and peer networking rather than it being the conventional hub and spoke mode that we always think of when we think of technology traditionally when we think of technology we think hub and spoke and that's why there is an aadhar database in delhi and everybody has to submit their information to that single database but we don't need to think of technology as only supporting centralization which is the problem but it can actually su support the uh, non hierarchical or the peer networks 
one thing i wanted to add to what gn said is see one of the problems with technology and we know about it in the social media space even more than any other spaces what we call as creation of eco chambers eco chambers is basically everybody is talking only to the people who agree with them who believe in the same things that they believe in and these eco chambers are greatly responsible for increasing stratification of society we are in a paradoxical situation i see new digital technologies actually enable better communication possibilities then society should be more coherent than it was before but we actually see in front of our eyes that uh, whatsapp or all these social media platforms are and greatly pushing for more and more stratification more and more you know echo chambers of people so my thought would be how can we enable and that is also visible in children who go to schools so we have a very stratified school system in india we have the elite government schools the kendriya vidyalayas and navodaya vidyalayas we have the elite private schools and we have schools across the entire social spectrum how can we get children to talk to one another across these spectrums how can a, like for me if you take my background as an upper caste upper class uh, you know male i i grew up with particular perspectives in my schooling environment there were very few dalits there were no adivasis uh, there were very few people from other religions in the group that i was uh, learning together with how can technology break through these kind of social uh, cultural barriers that exist um, amongst people in society and definitely amongst children and learners also i think that kind of a learning will be very different from uh, only cognitive learning that we focus on today so i would look at technology as enabling Redu- reduction in the social stratification that is happening i'm, I'm of course i'm de- i'm dreaming because that's not what is happening but this is what i would like to see happen I think, uh, yeah. content is not something which as a stand alone uh, you know particularly and talking about school education content is not outside of the teaching process that somebody will make some good quality content and then we provide it to the teachers i think that's a very problematic perspective on uh, education itself if we we have our perspective on content cannot be a commercial provider you know whatever be uh, the so called quality of their content we have to necessarily think of content as a participatory teacher created process within that quality standards have to come there has to be curation and that curation is best done by teachers communities so i think the more we keep edtech vendors out of the whole education technology space there is some dim chance that technology can be useful the minute commercial interests are allowed to come in it will be the death knell of education i think i have absolutely after all you know 15 years of working in this space i have absolutely no doubt in my mind that commercial considerations proprietary considerations in terms of content production and content supply is very much the wrong direction to take but quality benchmarks frameworks all that is important the process of engaging with one another on content issues is what will make teachers communities of learning a uh, flourish so we need to think of content from that point of view as a by product of teachers conversations with one another and with students rather than as some externally mediated uh, artifact yeah thank you i think that you know i've had this whole debate in my own mind as to how does the teacher and the technology how do these two relate to each other and always the danger that exists that digital technologies particularly can be used to disempower teachers i mentioned it in my initial remarks also so i would think that the way we have to visualize digital technology is how can it empower the teacher and then everything we design about technology should answer only that one question even this new thing that we are calling as personalized learning and artificial intelligence even when we are exploring those issues we need to really think can i use artificial intelligence can i use big data can i use machine learning algorithms in way that the teacher is empowered and the reason i'm saying is that i'm and i'm particularly focusing on school education i'm not an expert at all in higher education so i will not comment on that but having worked for a long period in school education i can say that the teacher child relationship is the most important part of teaching learning because teaching learning in school education is not simply about imbibing some complex content and then uh, being able to regurgitate it in the exam it is really conceptual understanding that conceptual understanding requires a good healthy relationship between the teacher and the learners and it need not be again up and spoke it has to be collaborative classroom environment and to the extent digital technologies can be used by the teacher completely in a free and open manner so it should be open resources like you mentioned in terms of content it has to be free software in the terms of the digital tools that are used 
because only these will provide empowerment to the teacher if it's proprietary content or proprietary software both will not allow the teacher full freedom in deciding how exactly to frame a lesson how exactly to frame a conversation between the teacher and the learner if we are able to stick to these two principles that it has to be free and open and it has to empower then we can find that the teacher will explore and experiment and figure out ways of reaching out to learners because there is no one answer what will work in Bidar will not work in Bangalore, and what will work in Bangalore will not work in Bombay. So we cannot think that there will be some standard ways by which uh, technology can support teacher empowerment. Of course, we need to build the teachers' abilities to not only use technology. A lot of the conversation that we have is seeing the teacher as a user of technology and tech savvy. So the tech savvy means teacher can use applications. But I think the real challenge and what we need to do, apart from building teachers' ability to use applications. teachers critical perspective on technology is extremely important and we can do that in our own work in it for change we always focus on critical perspective on technology along with the use of technology because that is what will really help a teacher understand that technology can help her technology can harm her once these basic principles are clear i think there are enough number of opportunities in the digital world for the teacher to explore experience and then use them for the teaching learning processes i will give a slightly broad answer but i think i would like to stay at that level we can look at it in two uh, ways one is a pedagogical perspective and one is an economic perspective if you look at it from a this whole idea of content from a pedagogical perspective i think we have to agree that quality is not an absolute construct at all and i think this is sometimes we lose sight of it especially in the nature, in the case of content and we think this is quality content and that is not quality content i don't think there is anything like that because absolutely it is contextual so when you are talking about even indigenous knowledge or you are talking about different conditions of learners and different conditions of learning the issue is not whether a content is quality or not and therefore this uh, idea of proprietary good content versus bad oer content i think to my mind that debate is not a very useful debate we should see we should ask ourselves are we preparing every teacher to be able to pick up all the content that is not all pick up the content that's available and then customize it for what she wants we already talked about contextualization all content has to be contextualized for it to be i have taught in classrooms and i know that every time i go to a classroom i'm contextualizing it for that particular group of children i'm going to be working with so there is no absolute content that i simply keep using again and again once we accept that the teachers abilities are to be built to be able to curate to be able to access to be able to Uh, modify it to be able to revise to be able to contextualize to be able to change the language of to acculturize if you are accepting that the goal of education has to be teacher empowerment to use the content that is available and also shape it for the use that she wants to put to then quality of content is a irrelevant concept and this purposely pushing it to an extreme to say that that's not a debate the debate is can we empower our teachers so that's a pedagogical perspective the economic perspective is that when the minute we get into a situation where we have non copyleft content or we have proprietary content then we see very typically the nexus of the bureaucrat and the corporation and we see it everywhere it's very much so in the digital space also that there is a nexus but the bureaucrat is captured by the corporations to push their own agenda uh, and that is can only harm the cause of education so but that means we have an economic challenge which is how do you incentivize production the argument is that proprietary models incentivize production by giving a return to the producer open models do not incentivize the producer i don't know whether this argument is very true because as i said earlier if content is seen as a byproduct of teachers conversations teachers and teacher educators teachers and students conversations then the economic model is not so crucial but it is possible that we need to look at new policy environments by which we are able to incentivize even collaborative copyleft creation of content it may be possible to look at it for example in the medicine space i know that people are looking at pharmacy uh, r&d to go on open models and those models are to be explored the idea of cooperatives is an old old idea in you know in, in the production space corporations is one method of production cooperatives are another and in areas like milk production or many other areas cooperatives have been successful maybe in the whole area of digital content we need to look at cooperatives and how we can incentivize cooperatives the other way of looking at cooperatives in this space may be simply communities of practice communities of learning and those models are what policy needs to push 
rather than proprietary models under the guise of quality. Yeah, actually, uh, Amit, uh, last January, IT for Change uh, published a series of papers on AI in different sectors. So we looked at the logistics sector, we looked at fintech finance sector, we looked at the agricultural se sector, and one paper was on education. So the paper is titled Making AI Work for Indian Education. And in that, we have really discussed what are the possibilities and the pitfalls as far as AI is concerned in Indian, Indian, uh, for education. Indian education also is ex explored in some specifics. So I think one thing I want to say is that, you know, there's a guy called Kentaro Toyoma who interestingly worked with Microsoft Research. So at that time, obviously, when he worked with Microsoft, he must have been very bullish about technology and education. We all know Microsoft is a very big player in this area. But subsequently, he wrote a, a very, very interesting article which is titled, There Are No Technology Shortcuts to Good Education. And he says in that paper that every now and then we have a cycle of a new technology coming in. And when the new technology comes in, you know, it, it, it's not anything to do with digital also. It has to do with when TV came, we know that, you know, people said TV is going to change the face of education in India and all over the world. And Hamlog as a series, you know, I'm old enough to belong to an era where Hamlog was a... a television serial which people seriously believed will alter education in the country and he says every now and then the hype comes and after the hype there is disillusionment and the cycle keeps repeating because technologies keep changing and ai is i can see ai clearly as one of them where the amount of hype that we see today it's uh, you know it's mind boggling and the hype of ai is in single phrases personalized learning so Personalized learning is supposed to completely revolutionize teaching learning and, you know, all the failures of education are supposed to be rectified by personalized learning. These are some two, three very serious issues. You already mentioned one, Sahana also mentioned one, that there is already, whenever we talk about AI, there is bias. And simply because there is no, algorithm doesn't start from zero. Algorithm starts from decisions and paths that are laid out by the experts who are designing the AI in the first place and their biases can greatly be harmful. And in that paper that we published last January, I've highlighted that India has a very serious problem in terms of re reproduction of biases because we are a feudal society, much more than most societies. India has is unique for the caste system where every human being is superior or inferior to another human being simply because he was born in a particular family. And the idea of using the past to predict the future, the sense of AI, the sense of machine learning, the essence of algorithm is, can we look at the past and can we use the past to predict the future is simply replication of the caste system. We are already seeing it happen in schools without AI. For example, I'm told in Delhi government schools, children as young as in the third standard are, you know, classified. This child is going to learn mathematics, put him in one section. This child is not going to be able to learn maths, put this child in another section in class three. And when I'm saying that, I'm sure you can appreciate that there's a huge problem here because we know that it is the children of the marginalized groups, the Dalit children, the Adivasi children, the children of the poor who will be the children who will be identified as not good for maths and therefore good for vocational occupations. In India, vocational means a blue collar job, unorganized sector, low wages, poor quality of life. So AI is going to be able to do that very well because AI will clearly judge that the child of a plumber is good for plumbing, the child of a bureaucrat is good for liberal education. And that is what is the manifestation of, in some other space, we say bias. In education, we can clearly see that it will create a problem. Niti Aayog is already saying, let's use AI to decide who is good for vocational education. Niti Aayog is already saying that. So that is a danger that we highlighted in the paper, that bias is lethal in AI, and that is one thing. Second thing, this whole idea of personalized learning, there, there's a very wonderful article written by... Uh, a couple of authors, Van Dick, if I'm not, if I'm getting the pronunciation right, I can share the link in the chat also. They say that the whole idea of technology, technologification of teaching learning is creating a process called learnification. Learnification is atomizing a concept into narrower and narrower and narrower slices because that's how technology can deal with it very well. So you go, go from number system to, you know, uh, two digit numbers to addition of two digit, two digit numbers, addition without carryover. So you make it more and more thin sliced and then you create learning paths for children and you imagine that the child learns concepts of number systems 
by simply doing smaller and smaller slices of uh, learning uh, materials, experiences with learning materials. And that people say is not really the way children learn. Children learning is not in that atomized way. It has to be collaborative. It has to be social. And conceptual understanding is not so mechanical uh, a process. And uh, these are the dangers that are going to come with AI. And I think in the next few years, we are going to see a lot of hype and the government is also pushing it in a big way. I am told recently that there is a huge DST funding for uh, a lab at IIC Bangalore for setting up uh, personalized learning models using AI. So it's already, you know, some multi few hundred crores have been pumped into this entity. So we are going to see that AI is going to create these kind of challenges. And of course, commercial pressures, which are the original one we heard of Google and Baiju's coming together recently. So they are going to push their personalized learning models as the best thing that has happened in the education space. I can see a lot of danger, but what is a good possibility for AI? I would simply say, can we use AI to help the teacher figure out what are the different combinations, possibilities of bringing materials and methods together for constructing learner-centric uh, contextual learning paths? So the teacher is driving that process and Sahana said that also. I agree with her. If the teacher can be at the center of the process, then there is a possibility AI can do good. But if AI is used to displace a teacher, we are going to see uh, increased stratification, uh, reduce social mobility of education. That's the problem that I see. Sorry for a long answer. See, I think, Sahana, the really what we need to look at is what is education's purpose? I think if we have a common understanding of what is education for, for example, you're sitting in IIT and uh, we know that the IIT cannot be a market phenomena. IIT can only work if a very significant large part of the higher education budget of the government of India is put in the IITs. I'm sure you'll agree with that. If the market were led to create IITs, you'll have a gender law school where a student has to pay lakhs to get admitted and IITs will only be for the rich people of this country, right? So we must understand that education is very different from you know, buying or selling shampoo where you can have a 10 rupee shampoo, you can have a 1000 rupee shampoo, you can have a 10,000 rupee shampoo, doesn't matter. Whatever you can afford, you can buy. But education is not a market good. I think this is what we need to really understand that the purpose of education is, it is a process of social mobility. It is the only way by which a Dalit child, an Adivasi child, a Muslim child, a girl child across the country can hope to be able to visualize a life of dignity as much as a upper caste. All of everybody in this panel, the three of us, we are upper caste, we are upper class. I mean, GN and I are also men. So we know that we are all extremely privileged people and our privileges has allowed us to come to the places that we are sitting in, whether it's an IIT or IT for change or Omi Baba Center. Caste, class, religion, privileges are what have allowed us to come here. And if we allow the market to come in and play any role, this will only continue. So only rich people will have a right to education. Why should somebody get a 10 cent product? Does it occur to you to ask that question that when you say 10 cent product and a $10 product, in your mind, it is already very clear that the poor child will get a 10 cent product, which is inferior to a $10 product and will continue a life of poverty, marginalization and lack of dignity. Whereas the parent who is able to afford a $10 product for his or her child that child will go up in life. Education is the essential process of mobility for all of us as children. And if you're able to accept a 10 cent and a $10 product in education, I think there's a very serious problem here. And I think every child deserves a $10. Why should a child deserve a 10 Guru, cent? Because the parents Guru, can't afford two, it. Two differences so, here, okay? One is we're just talking of some... Um, I agree with you when you say education as a large concept. Okay, We're not saying that these companies are going to come and take over education entirely. We they are talking of some... Play. No, the minute, even if you give them, Sahana, please understand, even if you give them a 5% space, you are accepting inequality. And the sense of education is not... Education cannot aim at inequality. It has to aim for equality. It has to aim I for don't equity. think we are debating that, that at all. I, we then are there not is no debating question. that. Hmm. Then there is no question for a commercial space because commerce means stratification. See, a if you look at a non-market good and a market good, by definition, a market good has to be 10 rupee tea for somebody, 100 rupee tea for somebody else, 1000 rupee tea for somebody else. And tea is okay. You can drink a 10 rupee tea and not die. But the minute you say a 10 cent product, you're clearly saying poor people will continue to remain poor 
because they will be in poor education and actually i want to challenge yeah. one second let me finish i want to challenge this thinking that china can do it india can't do it india can send a person to the mars india can build nuclear submarines but india cannot make sure that our children get decent yeah. education so i think our own our own preferences of policy what is convenient for us of course we can build nuclear submarines we can buy nuclear submarines we can buy rafale aircraft but education and people have done economists have estimated the cost of good education system it is not rocket it is not the cost of rocket science it is not the cost of sending people to mars certainly we can afford good quality education the minute we allow commercialization we go away from any possibility that we can have uh, equitable education for all they are completely i would say binaries we need to understand and appreciate that what is politically doable is a political question so that's what i would like to say go ahead yeah. so in your t example no i'm i'm actually making a much smaller point i think in terms of the larger point and all i, I don't see a ma- i mean i i don't see myself disagreeing with you there is a much smaller point i'm making taking your t analogy the difference between a 10 rupee tea and a 100 rupee tea is often in the frills you know the kind of chair i sit in the room whether i'm sitting in taj or in badlu cafe in uh, next to my department and all but there is an issue of the quality of the taste of tea i won't even use the word quality the taste of tea now i can get really rubbish tea in taj i can get excellent tasty tea in badlu but the cost difference is that of everything else that's coming around so the point i was trying to make is that when if companies are there if you know when companies are there what is what we don't want to withhold from people is this taste of tea somebody has you know wants to go and sit in taj a lot of people might know that yeah i'm just paying for the thrills we are not talking there is inequality yes not di- it's you no know, saying that there is no inequality there but it's actually the taste which is that's the only point i was trying to make here agree the, that tea is so taste has nothing tea. to do the market that's all i'm saying you can have any number of tastes let there be thousand tastes but it is on a market goods ahana i think you can do some reading on public goods and market goods i think then we will get a in india it's illegal by the way sahana let me tell you and everybody else in this call in india for profit education is illegal what google and byju's are doing is illegal somebody can go to court there's already a supreme court judgment which says unnikrishna judgment which says education cannot be for profit in india of course we know that there are uh, what is it called uh, people exploit loopholes and all but tea and education are different sahana that's what we need to understand agree so why yeah. are you debating the lack of, you know the existence of private schools now You know, private schools is... are not for profit. They are supposed to be not for profit. So commercial. We are not against private. I am not against private, and GN is not against private. We are against commercial. There is a difference between private initiative, which is not prof- for, for profit, and commercial. So there are a lot of differences we need to uh, be very clear about. I work in a private agency, which is IT for change and NGO, but I am a not for profit. Not for profits can set up schools. A not-for-profit will not have a ten-cent product and a hundred-cent product. It's against the basic ethics of education. So, what Jane was saying, everything should be shareable. Not only the hardware, but the software, the content, and that's the whole free and open digital technology space. That whatever is that is shareable, and that thereby we reduce the footprint. I think the other thing I want to add is there is a clear problem about the political and the technological in today's world, and. there are you know we assume that technology will run in its own space and we are simply following it but that's not true every society makes choices uh, about the direction in which society should go so if google is powerful today amazon is powerful today it is because today's legal frameworks political frameworks allow that so even in the case of environment it's not that technology is running up pace and environment is in danger that's also a conscious choice that we are making and therefore my thinking is that how can the political come back and control the technological how can the political come back and control the economic so that education concerns and environmental concerns are both taken care of and you know in france i'm told there was a proposal many years back to say you should not be allowed to send emails after 5 o'clock so what is the kind of life that we want to live economically philosophically and how can we use policy to regulate that to the extent that we are able to uh, prevent economic uh, uh, interest from creating problems for the environment i'm just saying political has to come back and play a key role by political i don't mean politicians i mean our collective will 
the allowing people to be fooled by packaging no is that what we want education to be some packaging that will fool people it's not about fooling people but some people want if so are you saying that we should just not have any you can't have stratification can't. the whole idea of education is not money making see people a teacher gets a no, salary no, so so if you have stratification you are you are you are getting to unethical mm-hmm. ground that's what i want to really caution you it's yeah, unethical yeah, to provide stratification what tasmita is saying is it's it's a very complex reality so we need to be able to um distinguish our arguments in two ways and we need to do both at the same time one is we have to see what is the reality that we are in we are in a reality that the governments are not willing to invest in education we are in a reality that governments are not interested in empowering teachers we are in a reality that government is not interested in the mobility of the marginalized groups this is real and it's not only government i think society itself our political will that every child should get the same quality of education it's not there uh, as i said earlier india is a caste system and the you know the upper caste person is not going to like it if the his driver's children are going to the same school that his children are going that is a real that's a reality of today and that and the reality is also that the dalits and the marginalized groups are also desperate because they know that the government school is not giving them what they should get and therefore they are going into tuitions and the sad thing is you know in rich families the child may go to tuition in class 8 in poor families i have seen children are going to tuition from class 1 because the faith in the government system or the faith in the regular school is very low so this is a reality we need to understand that we need to resist it we need to see what we can do about it but independent of the reality there is also a purpose of education so the purpose of education is not to create inequity create inequality create stratification the purpose of education is a new society in which there is equality there is equity there is justice there is democracy education itself is a process of moving from one to the other moving from inequity and stratification to equality and equity but the fact is while education is supposed to be that process of transcending inequality education itself becomes subject to inequality so this is a complex reality we are living in we need to be able to do both we need to be able to at the normative level clearly argue that uh, something like byjus is wrong coaching classes are wrong because if again it depends on what is the purpose of the coaching class the po- coaching class is really working on progressive educational processes and not in a you know trying to say your child will become better than my child then coaching by itself may not be a problem if it is conforming to the educational principles philosophies processes of a equitable democratic society but we know that mostly coaching classes are not like that coaching classes are simply to give a competitive edge or to fulfill a gap left behind by the main school system so while we look at realities education is not about replicating those realities so we cannot argue coaching classes are there therefore 5 cent and 10 dollar technology products are okay no coaching class is wrong technology products are also wrong so we need to be able to argue at the level of principle and say this is wrong this is right at the same time we also look at the realities and say how collectively we can get all of us together to resist that reality and bring forth a new reality that has happened you know i'm sure when sati was pra- being practiced several people would have said sati is being practiced what can we do about it let us burn more women at the pyre but raja ram mohan roy said it cannot be done we have to protest against this we have to change the policy framework so china also did not make it illegal suddenly right they also would have seen a lot of challenges with coaching classes with the way tech companies are going about it and they said we will change the policy framework in a communist country it may be easier in a democratic situation like india it will be much more difficult i don't have any illusions of that but we have to be asking ourselves what is it that we want to do we are working in education as a person working in education do you want to increase that stratification or do you want to counter stratification and like kishore said in the chat why are we imagining that equity and quality are two different things that equity uh, you know promotion is different but you know stratification can still happen because quality is satisfied by that quality equity go together so we have to be clear about the normative space that education is we have to be clear what we will promote what we will oppose but accept that the reality is not what we want it to be but education is a process of transcending that reality let us understand that 